just to perform her in a little musical extravaganza, we've cooked up for you wonderful people. Cults are secretive. Only some people have access to all the cult's information, their finances, their leadership hierarchy. I'm ready to walk away from everybody that I've ever known and cut ties with my own husband, my own mother, because you don't know what they're going to decide. Very often, my experience is people choose the church. Would you like to see the church go away or just change? Um, it's a hard thing because I know a lot of them have been in for a long time and I know they're good people. It's the policies of the church. It's the parishioners that have the power. It's the parishioners that actually could affect change um, by just not subscribing. A cult is a group started by an individual who claims that if you just give almost all or all of your decision making over to him or her, they will share with you some old secrets of the past that they've discovered or they'll share with you new secrets that they've just discovered. But it's more a cultic relationship in which you, the follower, turn over your decision making to this person and you surrender and obey in return for them sharing with you their supposed secrets. The main difference between organized, institutionalized and recognized religions in the world and cults is that the recognized religions have the followers venerate God, place their adoration to God and abstract principles whereas cults have the followers place the veneration and the adoration on the living cult leader. Cults tend to be totalistic. They tend to have a rule that covers everything. They tend to be totalitarian in that the cult leader has all of the power and decision making. Most of the modern day cults have a double set of ethics in which as a member, you're to tell the truth to the other people in the group, but because the outside world are regarded as lesser beings, sinners, unenlightened, they can be lied to and tricked. Another quality of cults is that they are elitist, in which they believe that all the members are special persons and above others in the world, so that that makes it all right for the double set of ethics to be used. Most cultic groups differ from altruistic and educational groups in our society because the primary purpose of cultic groups is to gather more members and to gather more power and money for the cult leader so that it's primarily the promotion of the cult leader rather than the growth and development of the followers. What's wrong with cults is that they recruit deceptively so that people when they join have no idea what the group is on occasion and most of all people don't realize what the bottom line is going to be, what joining the group is going to entail across time. And then what's wrong with cults, meaning why society criticizes cults, is that the cult leader grows wealthier and more powerful while trying to convey to the followers that he is helping them. But the main goal is to create more power and wealth for the cult and for the leader rather than for the benefit of the followers. I have had the pleasure of working with one former cult leader 
who he was more amazed at how easy it was to get people to obey. His cult broke up, and he was most interested in talking with me about his experience of shock at how easy it was to con people, how easy it was to manipulate them, how easy it was to get them to give up their money to have sex with him or whoever he told them to. He was so amazed that he couldn't believe it. And he said what was so fascinating to him was that many of his followers were young adults and full-grown adults who had been very rebellious people. And here he found them so willing. Once he had conned them with his smooth talk, his soft sell, his I'll love you forever, your mind will make this perfect new order, how easily he got them to obey and do anything. That was the thing that fascinated him the most. And also he was rather depressed because he missed it now. In the United States today, it's estimated that there are approximately 5,000 cults. The lowest guess is about 3,000, up to 5,000 cults in the United States today. And some of the countries overseas regard cults as among our least desirable exports, because many cults start here and then have gone overseas. At various points in time, and especially during the past two decades. It's estimated that as many as 20 million people have been involved at one point or another. But at any particular point in time, the estimates are that there's about two and a half to three million people at any point in time in these last two decades involved in a cult. The number of cults are growing, and the problem of cults is not fading. In fact, there are more cults today than there were 10 years ago. And when we think that the cult not only has an impact on the person that gets into the cult, but it has an impact on all of their family members, so that it is, the cult phenomenon is impacting on a large number of people in the world today. Cults can be started around any content. There are religious-based cults, philosophical-based cults, cults formed around politics, health fads, outer space and flying saucer cults. I've even worked with people that came out of horse cults, where a person had formed a cult around the care and maintenance and learning to ride horses. I've worked with people that got into cults in which the whole group's life was put into wandering around the country waiting for a spaceship to come and pick them up. So that cults can be started around any topic. So that what I've noticed over the many years I've been studying cults is there's an ever-changing theme. As something in the society changes a little bit, there are some venal people, meaning self-serving, manipulative people, who realize how the big cults are able to manipulate people. And venal people with enough charisma to get a following start their own little closed, intense, culty group. One of the changes we've seen is that the earliest cults were primarily youth cults in which the youth were recruited in then put out on the street soliciting funds and more members. Then as some of the uh, other cults sprung up and developed, they then started selling courses to adults, to people who are working, and in recent times have started selling their philosophies and their wares to the elderly, so that there's been a change across time as to who, crewed, who has been recruited by cults. The term brainwashing is a popular term 
describing what's classically called a thought reform program. And all those terms mean that a person or an organization has put into place a coordinated program of coercive influence and behavior control. See, the word cult refers to the relationship between the followers and the leader, in which the leader is all powerful. And then the way the leaders, as we say in psychology, shape the behavior, make the person adopt the policies and attitudes, is done through a thought reform program. One of the fantasies, and it is a silly one indeed, that's gotten into our society is people think that someone that's been exposed to a thought reform program is turned into a robot uh, or an automaton. And uh, sometimes the cults try to play up that those of us who study thought reform are saying people are robots and automatons and mindless. No one has ever said that's what thought reform accomplishes. And there was a movie called The Manchurian Candidate and some other movies that gave the whole wrong idea of a thought reform program. A thought reform program merely puts into place ways to get you to put your old value system aside and make your decisions based on what you know the cult leader wants and will reward. But you're still making decisions, but you're making them in the context of what will keep you from getting in trouble and what will get you rewards within the cult. But brainwashing doesn't make a zombie. In order to put into place a coordinated influence program, you don't have to lock them up. You don't hold a gun at the head. In fact, just the opposite, a smiling big brother effect is far more effective. Social psychologists, manipulators, salesmen have known for centuries that the soft sell, that sugar and honey, is a much easier way than uh, iron-fisted, demanding ways. So that the most powerful influence programs the biggest deceptions are put into place through smiling, uh, soft sell techniques and not gun at the head and not imprisoning people. The first is that the person must be unaware that the management is changing his or her behavior with a double agenda. It looks like what is going on, but the idea behind it is to change your behavior so that you will carry out what management wants done for their goals. Some cults do give their name up front, but the average citizen doesn't do enough reading to realize what this means. Cult recruiters don't try to argue a person into the group. The average citizen thinks, and they say to me, oh, no one could ever argue me into a cult. And I say, cult recruiters don't argue people in. They are real soft soap, soft sell convincing salespersons who lure you in, who cajole you in, who flatter you in. They come up and they say, you look like an open loving person. I'd love to tell you about this group I'm uh, studying with. And you have no idea that you're step at a time getting moved along toward
being exposed to a very organized recruiting program once you get to the cult facility. Many of the cults recruit people by selling them one kind of a course or another. And they take you, and most of the groups have the first course be very cheap and simple, $15, $20, $25. And you buy that course. And then that is that first fatal step toward getting more and more pulled by the group, more and more people and pressure to get you to come along with the group. I have discovered that medical doctors, nurses, psychologists have recruited their patients into the cult to which they belong. I find this very unethical. If your doctor or your psychologist ever asks you to come to some kind of a group that they're involved with, remember, Dual relationships are not good. You just want to keep your professional relationship, have your doctor stay in his or her role, you stay in your patient role. Don't get involved in their social life, their religious life, their political, their psychological life. Keep them in that narrow role and protect yourself from getting recruited by them where they already have an undue power and an undue influence over you as a patient. Love bombing is if I come up to say to you and say, what an attractive, bright, intelligent looking person you are. Are you from around here? And that flattery will get you to say, well, no, I'm from out of town. And then I'll say, oh, how interesting. Why don't you come to my uh, course with me, or come to the place I live, or come to this international living group I'm with, or come to my health food commune? And in no time at all, this love bombing is simply someone flattering you, and they take you to their facility. And at that facility, they may be selling meditation, a new lifestyle, a new psychology of life, an old or a new philosophy. And the group, because they want to get you to come and help them grow more powerful, will love bomb you, mean flatter you, tell you you're the best in the world. And if you're lonely and sort of without some friends at the moment, they've got the hook in to really lure you in. And that's what love bombing is. I've often said, after interviewing people, that I came to realize that these young women that I'd interviewed had not gone out looking for a cult that was going to put them out on the street as prostitutes, soliciting men to come back to the cult that they had simply been at a vulnerable position in their life, and a cult recruiter got them to come to the group and accept a lot of the flattery and the charming attention that they were given. And when a person is lonely and in between meaningful jobs, meaningful relationships, we're all vulnerable to flattery, and false promises, so that across time, most of us who study cults have discovered that it's not any special type of person that gets in a cult, but it's people who are approached by a cult recruiter at a vulnerable period in their life. A myth in our society is that it's only crazies and stupid people and weird people who get in cults. And that's not true. Anyone that's trusting and open and goes along with an offering made by a stranger has made that first almost fatal step 
of opening themselves up to further cult inducement and recruiting. I know of no cults who warn members that anything the cult does may not be good for the followers. Because most people, if they had full information about what the bottom line of joining the cult was going to read, many of them would never join, they tell me. They told me afterwards, had they known, they would have never joined. But because there was so much deception, they went along. Then pretty soon they were so dependent on the cult, there was no, thing, no place, no thing to go back to. So that part of what we hope through this videotape is to help people start reading and learning who are these new groups you're hearing about, who are these new organizations you're hearing about, and do a lot of research before you join anything. Secondly, to run a thought reform program, you need to get a hold of a good deal of the person's time, and especially their thinking time, so that they don't dwell critically on what they're doing, they don't think about it, and you get control of their time. So you start splitting them off from their friends, their associates, getting them dependent on you. Some cults move recruits far away. And the reason behind this is to separate you from your parents, your family, your friends, your everyday identity, so that they can immerse you in the philosophy, the ways of the cult. Most cults keep people very, very busy, very occupied, as many hours of the day as possible, as many days of the week, in order that these people don't have time to form meaningful relationships with outsiders. And so they can't keep good connections with their old friends and maintain contact with their family. Not all cults are live-in cults. There are a huge number of what I call live-out cults in which you go to the facility of the cult many, many hours per week, but you're sent out or allowed out to carry on a career so that you can buy the courses and have money to donate to the cult. But you don't judge whether it's a cult or not as to whether you live in or live out. In order to hypnotize someone, you don't have to do like stage magicians of swing watches or have a person look at the eraser on a pencil or stare at a spot on the wall. You can do it by controlling your voice, by doing as I'm doing now, get it a bit more sing-songy and chanty. And you can watch people's breathing and pace your phrasing so that you can start cooling them down, getting them into a light trance. And then most trance induction that's used by various cults then utilizes guided imagery in which the speaker appears to be telling a parable, repeating a verse over and over again, telling a story of his childhood in a soothing, rhythmic, way in order to get the person into a trance state. Why would a cult leader want to get a person tranced out a bit? What hypnosis and trance induction does is it gets your attention and my attention highly, highly focused. So we don't have critical thoughts. We don't judge what we're doing. We just trust the person that's giving the visual imagery and the relationship. And it makes us much more malleable and suggestible in that state. So that once the leader gets us into a light trance, then the speech, the sermon, the message that they put in has a lot more impact than 
had they done it without doing the transinduction first. So that's why they do it. It makes us more malleable, more suggestible, and it shuts out that critical mind chatter that we have, such as while you're watching this video, you're asking questions and saying, I wonder if she means, I wonder if she's going to get to. If you were being tranced out, that kind of questioning thinking gets put aside and you're just listening to the voice, and the image, and then what the words say to you, you're much more likely to incorporate into your thinking. Many cults use forms of mantra or empty mind meditation because it's a way of having a practice that you can sell. And after you sell the first course, then you sell longer and more prolonged and more intense variations on the empty mind meditation. The effects for some people can be pretty disastrous because from some prolonged empty mind meditation, people describe to me how hard it is for them to read a book and have continuous thinking, continuous processing of information. Some tell me that from practicing mantra meditation for many, many years, many, many hours a day, the <clears throat> people have really lost the ability to not have meditation intrude into their volitional behavior. People tell me that they will be driving down the street and suddenly their mantra meditation state will come on and they'll forget where they're going, they'll have to get off the freeway and think over where were they going, what was the plan, because they can no longer exclude the starting up of the meditation process. This psychological mechanism of reframing is putting a label on something that makes it fit in with what you're selling. Reframing is taking a normal expected physiological or psychological or emotional response and putting a name on it that helps a cult leader reframe and call it something to prove his point and especially to make it seem as if he has magic. Each cult has a theme, and when there are natural disasters, almost every cult reframes, meaning puts a label on that, to make that, make his message more believable and more frightening if you don't obey and do what he says you should do. Because who wants a flood, a hurricane, a, an earthquake? And cult leaders almost always say that if you follow their rules, it will help change the world and make it perfect. Many cults use uh, chanting, speaking in tongues, as a way of getting people to, one, obey them and do behavior that they want carried out. And a lot of time, prolonged chanting is one way of producing hyperventilation. That means over-breathing. And that means you just chant and chant and chant till you change the acid-base balance of your blood. And you get to feeling a tingling around your mouth, and your fingers and toes feel funny, and you feel sort of giddy. And cult leaders then reframe or interpret that normal physiological response to hyperventilation 
as something that the cult leader calls some magic state that you've gotten to. And many people who come out of cults and who are watching this videotape probably are suffering from episodes every now and then of hyperventilation. And if they've gone to hospital emergency rooms, they've been given a brown paper bag to breathe in and so on. And this happens when people get very, very anxious. And I'm always surprised that even college graduates can forget that they know often what hyperventilation is, and the cult leader has now called it that they've reached a new stage of enlightenment, a new stage of success. And it's just the effects of prolonged chanting and over-breathing. Jim Jones, along with many cult leaders, used a spy system and they still keep on using them today. Jim Jones had a spy system in place in which people came to him and they tattled. They told tales on everybody else in order to get in his good graces. And then it would make it seem when he would be talking to his group as if he got these messages by some superhuman means. And he would say, so-and-so, uh, you know, has been thinking lecherous thoughts about so-and-so. And in most cults, people have told me while they were in, they tattled all the time on their friends. Cult leaders are able to induce guilt in their followers by almost any means possible. If you think your mother and dad or your aunt or your uncle or your grade school teachers were good at making you feel guilty, Cult leaders do differently than our parents and the teachers. They take the power of the whole group and turn it against the person that they're putting on the hot seat and making them feel guilty. It's very rare that, you know, in a schoolroom that the teacher gets a whole class pointing and chanting, sinner, 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 and uh, so on. But cult leaders get very effective at turning the group to help make you feel more guilty. And then by having people who inform, it makes you feel guilty that you had even thought of anything because through the tattling network, the cult leader hears your innermost secrets that you only told your lady friend in the next room or that you told your husband or you told your wife. So you get to feeling guilty for even thinking thoughts that would get you in trouble with the cult leader. So the more and more you're made to feel anxious and guilty, the more and more you suppress any critical ideas toward the cult or the leader. The reason a cult leader or a group leader creates an enemy is to get tighter bonding within the group. Every cult, practically, is an us against them. So that if it's a Bible-based group, the outside world are sinners and satanic and bad folks, and we are the good ones. If it's a psychological cult, some of the psychology-based cults say, we're all sane. Everybody out there is insane. Um, it's bonding and tightening of group cohesion to have the outside world or specific enemy targets in the world and then the group tightly together. Most people watching this film will not realize the heady power that cult leaders have of having people just pay attention to them. It must be a heady feeling. And so in order to maintain that relationship, the cult leaders have to denigrate the outside world, put it down, make it seem unsafe. Often cult leaders tell members that if they leave the group, they will die of cancer, uh, that their mothers, fathers, relatives will have terrible disasters happen to them. They tell them they'll never get to heaven. Um, that they'll never be able to get 
their karma handled. They have all kinds of ways of making the outside world seem like something that one shouldn't affiliate with. There's a manipulation of rewards, punishments, and experiences so that you will stop exhibiting a lot of your behavior that you brought to the cult because they want to change you to a way they want you to appear. Cults often change members' names. This is a way of taking your old identity away from you and giving you the first step towards your new pseudo-identity, your new cult identity that you're to carry out. So those new names are to help split you away from your past. Almost without exception, each cult develops its own lingo, its own jargon. The purpose of that is to give the people some idea that they're joining this very special group that talks in a certain way and has certain knowledges. It has a second purpose. It separates those people from talking with their family, their friends, because they have to speak two Englishes. The English that's used in their cult, in which language is used in a very different way than in the outside world, and then having to almost translate their thoughts after they've been speaking cult jargon for a long time into everyday English. Cult lingo fractures normal, sequential, reflective thinking. Because if you're in a cult and you're asked something by the cult leader, and you might want to say, no, I don't want to do that, you have to translate that into the cult jargon that says, I will do your bidding. So that you have to get rid of the negative, break up all that thinking that went with what you were asked, and reformulate what you're supposed to say. If you and I were in a cult, we would be talking abstractions and jargon that doesn't always have real visualizable images and pictures, and yet we'd have to act as if we really understood each other. One of the reasons cult leaders and closed intense groups develop these abstract languages is that when we're a properly civilized person, we think we should be able to follow what someone says, and it's our fault if we don't. So we sort of turn inwardly. And in a way, if we're the least bit prone to trance induction, we're actually assisting the cult leader in our own trance induction by turning inwardly and seeking the meaning, trying to put more meaning into these abstract phrases. In many uh, cultic groups, the leader speaks a lot in imagery and allegories in which uh, he will describe the entire outer world as not pious or as satanic or as unenlightened. And it's part of stopping reflective thinking, meaning he doesn't want them to think about what are they doing here giving their life to him. What are they doing giving their money, obeying, letting him beat their kids, have sex with their daughters? He doesn't want them doing that kind of reflective thought. So that the more that leaders speak in globalities, the more they keep you from thinking critically. And then pretty soon you're almost trained like a pet dog. He speaks of Satan and everybody knows you're supposed to think the outside world is bad because the leader just used that charged word. Cults use denigration and ridicule and humiliation as a control mechanism in the following way. In the cult, it has become your new family. And 
Your whole status in this new family depends on them liking you and treating you nice. And if the leader keeps making fun and showing that you're a dope and that you just are a bad person, then you're so humiliated all the time. And you're going to keep working, trying to get in his graces and try to get some praise from the other people so that in a rather harmful way, it's used as a motivator. It's not a health-producing, mental health-producing motivator. But within those tight, controlled confines, it's used to show the leader is so pure, so above it all, so powerful, and you are this lowly follower. Most cults make use of confession, and why? It's one way for the leaders to learn things that you've done, that you feel guilty about, things, and then they'll use your guilt to manipulate you more. Or they'll learn things you're very proud of and very haughty about. They'll use that to break your spirit. So when you confess, it's not just telling your history to the group. Some cults, I have seen the uh, folders that they make on the members, so they write everything down. And some groups have one-on-one -on -one confession groups where the second person writes everything down. So that the idea of the confessing is to get information that will then be turned around to manipulate. And it's also getting the person after a while to confess to things to say they want to be more like the group, they want to get in with the group, so that they're purging themselves in order to merge with the group. Certain groups give great praise for people getting up and confessing and breaking into tears and breaking down. Some of the psychological-based groups say that finally they've gotten insight. Finally, they're feeling their primal pain. They're feeling their basic pain. Finally, they're attaching. And different groups label this breaking down in front of the group to serve their own ends, to tell the person, now you're behaving like we want. A pseudo-personality in the context of cult life refers to the personality that gets displayed after a person gets adapted to the cult social resocialization training. So that when relatives say, my son just doesn't seem like himself anymore, or a wife will say, you know, my husband has been going to all of these meetings and he's changed so much, he just doesn't seem like his old self. What they're describing is the elicited behavior that the cult is getting into place, that is displayed in social circumstances that call for it. And remember, the behavior learned in cults will wither if you're away from the cult long enough because it is a superimposed identity. It is a pseudo-identity. It is a pseudo-personality. Within most cults, the leader urges people to revise their personal history. And they don't do it blatantly and say, now, Jonathan or Jane, revise your personal history. What the cult leader in certain cults does is he wants to show newcomers that these people were such sinners, such awful people, drug users, just the worst criminals, that people that were just plain ordinary folks like the rest of us, just regular folks with no criminal record, no drug, no nothing, will get up and confess to histories that make them seem just like hideous people that have been saved by this group. Another reason that 
people's personal histories are revised in cults is to mostly convince them that they have not been good people ever and that they need the cult. There are a number of cults, both New Age and some, you know, New Age closed groups, and some cults that do past lives, history, work. When I hear from people their recounting of past lives that they worked on while they were in their cults, they come out still wondering, was it true? How did it happen? And that's part of the uh, counseling and psychoeducation that's needed is to explain to people how the words of the second person in the cult who helped do the eliciting of the past lives and training them how to have imagery that went with past lives became very adept at using words to trance the person out enough that the imagery that they made in their mind was very, very vivid. And the language of the trainer or whatever the second person in the cult was called helped them vivify this. And after coming out of cults, I've worked with people who said to me over and over again while I was in my cult, this person that worked with me on my past lives had me go over and over when I had been a violent man, when I had been a violent killer, when I tore heads off of babies, just the most gruesome things. Those are what are called pseudo-memories or confabulations in which the event never happened. But the word power of the second person was organized in such a way as to get the person to create a false memory. And in cults, they come to think that, gee, that was their past life, and that they were these people that they have to name and deal with. And um, it has a really profound and relatively long-lasting impact on people. We've come to see that a very important one of these effects is desensitization, in which while you're in the cult, you come to see things done to other people, such as parents will have seen their kids beaten, they will have been instructed to lie and do things, in which they have carried out conduct that was so against their conscience, but pretty soon they were totally desensitized to it. The street recruiters who raise money under false pretenses, for example, telling people on the street they're raising money for a drug rehab center, and they know the cult doesn't have a drug rehab center. They've been conditioned by the leader to think that it's all right to lie to these outsiders. They'll call them uh, systemites, Babylonians, sinners. The cult leader will have taught them that they are the elite and these outsiders can be, re, you know, lied to because they're lesser beings and that they're just restoring to God what's his because the leader will have claimed that he's more powerful than Jesus, more powerful than Mohammed, more powerful than God. And these people really feel that within that system they're doing right at that time. And when they begin to think about it and finally leave, many of these people tell me about just unending guilt that they have about lying to people and getting so puzzled at how could they have put their conscience on deep freeze like they did. And the next condition that needs to be present is that it is in a system where you can't complain to management. You just acquiesce. It is a closed system in which management's always right, you're wrong. And see, within a cult, 
the leaders don't want little factions and segments because the cult will come apart if factions are allowed to grow. So that's why they're totalitarian and autocratic. You see, in a democracy, you get many, many little factions. And in a democracy, we all get turns at running this society. One year it's your group, next year it's my group, another year it's someone else's. When you're running a cult, you don't let it get democratic. And you do everything you can to break up bonding between people and keep the bonding to the leader. There are cults where farmer members have told me that the leader said to them, you're going to have to learn to obey. And as time went on, they learned more and more how to obey. And eventually the leader would say to them, even if I say two and two is five, you must say two and two is five. Those cult and closed group leaders who use prophecy on the whole keep just pushing the prophecy farther ahead in time and blaming the followers saying the prophecy didn't come true because you followers have not been doing your chores right. You haven't been meditating right, you haven't been praying right and enough, you have to do more and better. And that it's your fault not the cult leader's prophecy that was wrong. You folks caused it. And they just moved the prophecy date forward. So that in time, the cult recruit who's being subjected to an organized, coordinated influence program that we're calling thought reform here, they're being taken a step at a time through what we just went through. They are unaware that they're being changed a step at a time. The old behavior is being pushed out. The new is being elicited and that there are manipulations of various kinds of experiences and rewards from the group and so on being carried out to get the old behavior that they don't want and the new that they do want shown. And there's no complaining to management. Many cults and new age groups and churches that are abusive, meaning some of the newer groups that use these types of thought reform and psychological manipulation techniques, a number of them have been taken to court by former members who seek redress for some of the psychological, financial, and other damages that the conduct of the cult or closed group produced. One doesn't sue about beliefs and so on. Our First Amendment says anyone can believe anything they want. But our laws say everyone's conduct, yours, mine, cults, conduct, can be taken to court, can be taken before law enforcement agencies and looked at. Through education, we can provide young people, as well as adults and even the elderly, how to critically evaluate when someone approaches them and makes an offering to them that sounds just too good to be true. We need to combat the cult problem by teaching critical evaluative thinking. We need to teach people to reason very well. And we need to teach people of all ages how to see faulty logic, and to be skeptical when people make offerings to them. So I feel those two methods apply the laws that should be applied 
to any conduct that the cults do that's illegal, and for us to really do as much education as possible. And I hope that some of the people watching this video are mental health professionals who will get a feel for the need for psychoeducational explanations of how hypnosis works, how hyperventilation works, of how forms of influence, guilt induction, anxiety production are used in cults to manipulate and change and get people to stay so that when people come out, mental health counselors can do more of an educational helping than as some therapists do, just want to go back to your childhood and blame it on your folks and, you know, problems you had with your brothers and sisters. Unless counselors know about cults, they really don't know how to help you with what the problems are that you come out of cults with. And so many, many psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, counselors are getting much more in tune with how to help educate their clients about what happened in the cult. And not as many therapists do say, skip all of that, I want to hear only about your childhood. That's when your personality was formed. Personality can be changed and altered in adulthood. And that's what one sees the thought reform programs doing altering the display of our basic personality and creating a pseudo-personality, the personality that you display while you're in the car.